reading from the book of the prophet Baruch. Jerusalem, take off your robe of mourning and misery. Put on the splendor of glory from God forever. Wrapped in the cloak of justice from God, bear on your head the mitre that displays the glory of the eternal name. For God will show all the earth your splendor. You will be named by God forever, the peace of justice, the glory of God's worship. Up, Jerusalem, stand upon the heights. Look to the east and see your children gathered from the east and the west at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that they are remembered by God. Led away on foot by their enemies, they left you, but God will bring them back to you, borne aloft in glory as on royal thrones. For God has commanded that every lofty mountain be made low, and that the age-old depths and gorges be filled to level ground, that Israel may advance secure in the glory of God. The forests and every fragrant kind of tree have overshadowed Israel at God's command. For God is leading Israel in joy by the light of his glory, with his mercy and justice for company. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, I pray always with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is my witness how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception, to discern what is of value, so that you may be pure and blameless, blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord.
shall see is the salvation of God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the desert. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to talk about two topics, I suppose. And I think they're related. I guess I'll find out. I always discover these things as I'm speaking sometimes. But I, I have them in my mind. And the first is, uh, what does it mean to fill the valleys and to lower the mountains? And the second is a phrase that we'll use in the church, and it can mean a lot of things. We'll, we talk about the scandal of particularity. The scandal of particularity. Or it's a little bit scandalous or it's almost unbelievable to say that God entered time in a particular place, in a particular culture, as a particular person. That's almost unbelievable. That's what a scandal is, something that prevents us from believing. But this first point about what does it mean to fill the valleys and lower the mountains and straighten the paths. On the one hand, you could imagine building a highway, perhaps, you know, some of you were alive when they put in the interstates. They tear out buildings, they fill in some valleys, fill in some rivers, maybe your streams. We can imagine an army. This probably is what the, the image is hearkening to. There's a military going on a conquest. And so having to have all sorts of earthworks to have room for soldiers and chariots and horses so that way you can you know, conquer a, an enemy, enter Jerusalem, rout the enemy. But although those are analogies, the truth of what is happening is the Lord needs a space to be cleared for himself. And the highway is not a, a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. The highway is our heart, and we have to make space. We have to lower the mountains and, and raise the valleys and unwind the roads so that, it says, flesh shall see the salvation of God, so that you and I might see God. And we think about all the things that prevent us from seeing God, and they need to be filled and lowered and straightened and all, you know, and whatever else, untangled, untied, sorted out, ironed out. And the thing that John in particular called us out to and his voice is sort of calls out to us as he says he proclaimed a baptism of repentance. 
I know I've talked about it before, and maybe you've heard me or Father Enrique talk about repentance. But repentance in the church is a good thing. It's a good thing. Imagine this. Pick the worst criminal you can think of, the most hardened person. You know, as I say that, a person pops to mind. This is going to be like a scandalous idea. I'm thinking of the person who, uh, you know, drove through the crowd in Waukesha. You know, it's probably the most, whatever, hated person in Wisconsin right now. Right? Tell me I'm wrong, huh? Imagine what would happen if in that person's heart they were to come to an awareness of the destruction that they have caused and come before the families whom they've killed. You know, some people, I say this not lightly, I mean, I, I know some of those people. Or people they run over, you know, one of the priests I lived with for a number of years was in the hospital. So, you know, I'm not just sort of, these aren't sort of shallow words. Um, if you were to come before those people and just say, I'm sorry. Imagine that. We never hear that. We never see that. That's repentance. And then not only that, but then imagine that person then running to the Lord. Obviously, justice needs to be done. You know, penalty needs to be paid. But there is a particular joy when someone realizes that they have turned from the Lord and hurt others and returns. And there's a joy in that. And all of us are called to share in that, no matter who we are. We're not asked to condemn. That's for judges and lawyers and, you know, witnesses. I mean, they, they, they'll, they'll have their duty. The rest of us are, are called to seek forgiveness, repentance, each and every one of us. And John the Baptist calls out in the desert, repent, return, come back. And no one likes this. Well, sinners like it. But people that are the perfect and the righteous are repulsed by that idea. I mean, let me ask you this. Does it repulse you to imagine the most hardened of criminals coming to someone and saying, I'm sorry. If that angers you, then, then we are numbered among the self-righteous. It should fill us with a sense, a certain sense, amidst sorrow and, and certain anger, a certain amount of joy that the sinners are returning. Sinners love that message. I promise you that. All of us, turns out, are sinners. So all of us should hear the word, repent, Repent. Say, yes, that's good. That's good. That's a good thing. And in doing so, we lower the mountains, we raise the valleys, and we make a straight path to the Lord. And so this voice calls out of repentance to each of us. And maybe there is a connection between John the Baptist calling out and this idea of God becoming a person, a particular person. It says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Have you ever seen the salvation of God? Have you seen the salvation of God? You might have thought of it. You might have liked the idea. Have you seen it? Most people believe in God. I think I googled it. It's like 96% of people believe in God in the United States as of like two years ago. You know, maybe it's more now or less, but you know, very few people are atheists. Is like 4%, you know, not many people. Most people believe in God. Most people that believe in God like the idea of a loving God. Most people don't like the idea of a vengeful uh, or, uh, or, a, or a God that just sort of gives you what you are owed. Most people want a God that is generous and forgiving. But this is then where people start to struggle because then we say, well, God is a person a particular person who entered into history, they said, well, that sounds a little weird. You know, God became a baby. You know, God became a baby that cries. This is one of my godchildren crying in the front. So that's, I approve. She's approved crier. I planted her in the front. Um, God became a baby. It sounds kind of goofy and silly and, and fairy tale, and people make fun of it. You know, people make fun of Jesus who's goofing around. They'll dress up as Jesus for Halloween and, 
and all, the, all of the things that we make fun of about our faith. But let me ask you this. If we want God to be love, but we could never see God, how could we love God? If we wanted God to be love and we could never hear words from God speaking to our heart, how could God be love? If we wanted God to forgive us, but God didn't have a mind or a desire, how could God be love? The only way that God could be love is if God was a person that is, could desire something, could think, has a mind, whatever it means that God in all eternity has a mind. But what's even more is you wouldn't be able to know that God. You wouldn't be able to love that God or to be loved or to know that you are loved unless that God broke into history. If God was forever an impersonal force or the force or you know, whatever sort of, sort of energy, you would never know the love of God and you would never be able to express your love to God. The only way that a God is love, who is a person, could be known by us and could be loved by us is if he entered into time. We call this the incarnation. This is Christmas. And so the beginning of our gospel speaks to this. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, in a particular time, when Pontius Pilate was governor and Herod was tetrarch, and there's Philip and all of the other governors, that is, in a particular culture, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, in a place of a particular religion, the word of God came and was known. And John prepared the way by repentance, but eventually he was able to be seen and to be known and to be loved in the person of Jesus Christ. We believe in God. We want a God that is loving, but we can't love anything unless they become real, unless they enter into our lives, into real time and space. And what does that mean? But that means that God sheds his eternal, in a sense, his eternal reality, and he limits himself into a particular person in a particular place, in a particular religion and culture and language and body, and it's a scandal because it seems a little bit weird. It's almost unbelievable. But I guess my point is, is it, it couldn't be any other way. And to think that that God has then been seen by you. Well, so what does this mean, this last idea? Well, maybe God was seen in the past. I saw God, you know, Peter saw God. He saw salvation. John saw salvation. Mary saw salvation. Pontius Pilate. But what about you and I? And this is where the church comes in. We say that the church provides for us the visible presence of the ear, well, the invisible, eternal God through all time, particularly in the sacraments and in the sacred scriptures. When you hear the word of the scriptures, you hear the voice of God. You know, and you could say that in a different way. If you don't hear the words of scripture, you don't hear God. If you don't read scripture, you don't hear God. But also, when we encounter the Lord in the sacraments, we see our salvation. That's what a sacrament is, is a visible sign of an invisible grace given to us by God for our salvation. And so, yes, there is the incarnation, God becoming flesh, becoming particular in Israel in the first century. But then there is the daily incarnation of God in the sacraments. And each of us encounter that all of us, in fact, today, you who are here at Mass, get a little glimmer of that, that, first, uh, you know, that first Christmas, that first nativity. There's no place for the Lord to rest his head, but in your hearts. He is seen by us in the Blessed Sacrament, known by us in the preaching and in the Scriptures. And then we welcome him in, in his humility, in his littleness, having let go his grandeur to be held in our hands and entered into our hearts. And so we listen to John, or we pray that we listen, as he calls out, repent, lower the hills, raise the valleys. Salvation 
will be seen. And together we bring all of our prayers and our needs to our Heavenly Father. That Christ may visit his holy church and keep watch over her always. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Christ may fill the Pope, our Bishop, and the whole order of bishops with spiritual gifts and graces. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Christ may guide the minds of those who govern us to promote the common good according to his will. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Christ may banish disease, drive out hunger, and ward off every affliction. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Christ in his mercy may free all who suffer persecution. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That as witnesses to Christ's love before all, we may abide in the truth. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the church will be continuously blessed with wise and holy priests, deacons, sisters, and brothers, chosen by Christ to lead souls to the glory of heaven. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intention of this Mass, Thomas McCormick, and for our personal intentions. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we call out to you, and we know that you hear us. So we ask that we might know your presence in our lives in answer to all of our prayers. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 